Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you are having fantastic Thursday afternoons. I think I'm going to do something that you don't hear very often. I'm probably going to give a better legal analysis of the Donald Trump Stormy Daniels situation than you can find anywhere else on the entirety of the internet. And that's because I think I've got a better working knowledge of what's going on here. I'll walk you through everything. That's going to be my lead off, but we got a lot to get to. ESPN has thrown Woke Center under the bus. Uh, WWE has incredible value. I'm going to break down some pretty cool numbers on how much every sport costs per viewer. Uh, Kirby Smart is worth $7 million a year. He becomes the fifth or sixth, depending on how you can't uh, count it, uh, college football head coach to make $7 million a year. Uh, Jason Witten officially retiring to join Monday Night Football. That retirement ceremony is going on as we speak. But I want to start off here, first of all, by telling you to go to sportsbookreview.com. Make sure that you get the best possible number you can on the Kentucky Derby, which is going to be underway this weekend. There are tons of different places you can gamble. And I'm telling you right now, uh, if you go look at the available numbers, why I would like buying and betting now is you don't do parimutuel betting. If you love a horse and you bet it at 10 to 1 and then it ends up being 2 to 1, you're not even really sure what the value you're getting on your bet is. So if you like a horse, go shop around, get the best number, make the best bet, go to sportsbookreview.com. Uh, early comment there, I happen to glance over Avengers Review, Sportsbook Review. Also, go get a mortgage, thehomeloanexpert.com, thehomeloanexpert.com. Make sure that you get the best possible number you can from a mortgage to get refied, to get uh, pre-qualified. It's a busy home buying season and it's time to get rolling. All right, I'll give you my review of Avengers here in a little bit. But first, I want to hit this off the jump. Last night on Sean Hannity's show, Rudy Giuliani, who is one of the attorneys representing Donald Trump, went on and said for the first time that Donald Trump had paid $130,000 to Stormy Daniels to settle this lawsuit. Now, before we get going any further, I believe that Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump had sex 12 years ago at the charity golf tournament that he went to. I believe her story is true. I also believe that it doesn't matter at all who the president slept with 12 years before he became president. People want to criticize Donald Trump here. I think what this represents is actually an element of humanity from Donald Trump. He doesn't want to admit to having an affair with Stormy Daniels because he's afraid that Melania might leave him. I think this is actually a moment of weakness from Donald Trump because if he had just come out and said, yes, I slept with her, this story disappears. I think everybody out there says, so what? Donald Trump has been married three times before. Did we really think he was a faithful husband? It's a lot like Bill Clinton. And I'm going to break down the legalities of why it's a lot like Bill Clinton here in a moment. But I'm going to talk to you like you're a jury. We all knew that Bill Clinton slept with a lot of women. Okay, So when he had an affair with Monica Lewinsky, our expectation was that he was the kind of guy who would sleep with an intern in the Oval Office. Donald Trump, our expectation is, you don't get married three times and live in the New York City tabloids if you are a faithful husband. To me, the interesting angle about this story is that Trump is trying to deny that he slept with her because I think he doesn't want to embarrass Melania and because I think he's afraid that Melania might leave him and I think the scary thing to Donald Trump about being president is not being president, it's waking up one day in the Oval Office or the White House residence and being there all by himself. I think that's what he would be afraid of. I think that's ultimately why he likes to tweet. I think this is a guy who craves attention but also craves the company of people that he likes. Okay, So that is, I think, the truth of it. But let's go into the legalities. What I have noticed happens very frequently is anytime a new bit of news comes out, there's an uproar and people are like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. And then it kind of disappears because so many of the people who are the immediate reactors on social media are very poor at actually understanding significance. And initially everybody just gives all the credence to somebody who comes out and says, oh my God, this changes everything. And there's not actually any factual basis to, to back it up. Now let me give you an example. I told you the moment that Sean Hannity was revealed 
as one of Michael Cohen's attorneys, uh, one of his clients in that court filing. Everybody was up in arms. They were like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. And I saw that news and I immediately said, why is this a surprise? It's not a surprise at all that famous people would share lawyers or that two guys who were in Manhattan and fond of each other, Sean Hannity and Donald Trump, might talk with each other and end up represented by the same guy based on their connections in that way. And yet everybody was up in arms. They're like, Sean Hannity has to be fired. He can no longer do his show. And then what happened? The story disappeared. Because ultimately when reasonably intelligent people looked at it who make decisions about these sorts of things, they went back and they said, you know what? There's not anything here. There is no story here. This is, to steal a term from the Obama campaign, a nothing burger. This was a smart strategic move, on the other hand, from Rudy Giuliani about what was going on. Okay? Here is the truth. Um, this story when you actually look at it, is actually really smart. And let me explain why. Uh, Rudy Giuliani is attempting to take away the ability of the prosecutors to put pressure on Michael Cohen over whether or not Michael Cohen had paid the $130,000. And if you pay attention to this in an intelligent way, you will hear the basis of what may very well be a Donald Trump argument to avoid Federal Election Commission uh, responsibility. And that is really straightforward, okay? He is going to allege that he paid a retainer to Michael Cohen on a regular basis. We don't know what that retainer is, but presumably Donald Trump and or his corporations paid a lot of money to Michael Cohen to ensure that Michael Cohen was kind of a consigliari to make sure that stories that were negative about Donald Trump never saw the light of day. And as a result, I think Trump is going to argue, look, I paid this guy $25,000 a month and under the, our deal, he was obligated to go ahead and pay for things like this if we decided that it made sense to settle it. And so while the story has been that Michael Cohen took money out from his home in order to pay this, the truth of the matter is, I think, something much more interesting. I think the truth of the matter is this. This is actually a story that is actually planted by Trump to guarantee that he is not actually responsible for anything. And I say that going forward very simply because there is no way whatsoever that Donald Trump, I think, is going to be impeached and certainly not that he's going to be removed from office over having a consensual sexual relationship 12 years ago. What this is about is about creating space such that nobody is ever going to be able to argue any longer that there is any truth whatsoever to the claim that Donald Trump tried to hide this payment. This is a smart play that was calculated with Rudy Giuliani. The tweets that he sent out this morning were read and written by his lawyers and he tweeted them out this morning and I think this is an opportunity and a responsibility by Donald Trump to create space between himself and this story. And I think it's really smart, strategic, brilliant from a legal perspective. People don't understand this, all right? You are not going to lose your office because of an, a Federal Election Commission violation. If you go back and look at virtually every single person who has run for political office at a high level, they have had Federal Election Commission violations. Obama did. Hillary did. Everybody has. Everybody has had Federal Election Commission violations because it's hard to manage that much money when it's coming in from so many different places. People have taken contributions from foreign governments. They have spent money improperly. All of that. Here is the truth. Um, here is the truth in general. I believe that uh, is this story is a fascinating one because the media is not intelligent enough to understand what's going on. And this is Donald Trump walling himself off from political liability. Now, here's the truth, okay? Let me also follow through on this level. When you talk about impeachment, most people have no idea what's required in order to be removed from office. They talk about impeachment and that is the totality of it. They're like, oh, so-and-so is going to get impeached. Do you understand what impeachment actually represents? Here is the truth. In order to be removed from office, which is different than impeachment, the House of Representatives votes by simple majority to impeach someone. The impeachment trial then takes place in the Senate. And do you know how many senators have to vote in order for a president to be removed from office? 67. 67 senators have to vote to remove a president from office. Let me tell you something. That 
ain't happening. Okay? It's just not going to happen. Now, Donald Trump might decide at some point, screw it, I don't want to be president anymore. That's more likely than the fact that he is going to be impeached and removed from office. If you hate Donald Trump, the way to get him out of office is straightforward and simple. Beat him in 2020. He's not going to lose his office because he banged a prostitute 12 years ago. And he's not going to lose his office because you are upset that he lied about banging a prostitute 12 years ago. I think what we are headed towards is a major battle over whether or not uh, Donald Trump will sit for a uh, deposition and or whether or not he can be subpoenaed here. And I think this is going to be an interesting case. I believe years ago in the Clinton-Paula Jones case, I think the Supreme Court got a case wrong when they said that, that it was not going to make too, take too much of Bill Clinton's time in order for him to sit in a courtroom and answer questions or sit in a, in a deposition and answer questions about the Paula Jones lawsuit. Bill Clinton's lawyers, I think, were correct when they said, look, the president should be Im immune from civil liability while he is in office. And if you go back and read that case, there was an 8-1 to one decision, and I believe Scalia might have been the dissenting vote. I can't remember exactly what the dissenting vote was. But what was amazing about that dissenting vote was he said, no, 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 what's going to happen is every president is going to get sued for everything imaginable and it's going to distract from his ability to be able to do his actual job. And so that is the reason why when you break down all of this situation, we are ultimately, I think, going to have to have another Supreme Court case about what exactly presidential privilege should entail and whether something like this should end up taking away from all of the president's actual time. This is the truth, okay? Um, any questions about this? Any questions about what's going on? The president is trying to eliminate the pressure that is on Michael Cohen by taking responsibility for the payment himself, which moves this, before he ever testifies or anything else, out of a criminal matter and puts it into a Federal Election Commission violation. And if you think a president is going to lose his, his, uh, his presidency over a freaking Federal Election Commission violation, there's no precedent whatsoever for that. In fact, the opposite is actually true. And he probably just admits that he committed a federal election violation in the way that he classified some spending. And as a result, then it's going to change. Why did he lie about it on Air Force One? Because everybody lies when they get accused of having sex with people they're not married to. I mean, is this really a surprise to people? How many guys out there who've been caught in an affair or women, the first time they get asked about it, say, you know what, you're right. I've been banging people I'm not married to. Is this really a surprise to people? This was actually what Bill Clinton said. Everybody lies about sex. I mean, this is like insanely commonplace. There's, he's not under oath. I mean, remember. Remember here. Let me explain. When Bill Clinton was impeached and the Senate elected not to remove him from office, remember what happened. He was in the Oval Office having an affair with an intern. He then lied about it under oath. Okay. So his actions took place while he was president, literally while he was in the Oval Office, literally with an intern, and then, as if that were not enough, he then lied about it under oath. He's still not a licensed attorney because of what he did while he was president. Compare that with Donald Trump. Twelve years ago he had sex. And then he paid a woman to not talk about the fact that they had sex. And then she talked about the fact that they had sex. This is one of the fascinating things about Stormy Daniels. She's like, she is thoroughly unlikable here. I don't know why every time that a guy cheats, people are like, I can't believe that guy cheats. How come nobody talks about the Stormy Daniels side? Stormy Daniels knew Donald Trump was married. She may well have known that he had a newborn baby. And yet she decided to bang him. And then she said, I'm going to tell my story about having sex with you. He said, no, 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 please don't tell the story about having sex with me. He then paid her $130,000, had her sign a non-disclosure agreement, and she still told the story about having sex with Donald Trump. I'm sorry, I don't understand how this is heroic on her behalf at all. She now makes a living as a stripper. She wants out of the undisclosed, uh, the non-disclosure agreement so she can write a book about their sexual relationship, which basically lasted for like 10 minutes. Why is she some paragon of virtue? 
Two people are required to cheat. Donald Trump, I think, cheated, all right? But he then paid her lots of money relative to what her normal income is so that she wouldn't talk about the fact that they had a, uh, an affair and then she decided to talk about it. I don't understand why women aren't out there like, it happens all the time. People focus on the male side. Why doesn't anybody focus on Stormy Daniels here? Why doesn't anybody focus on the fact that she had sex with him? Now, he denies that he had sex with her. I'm not surprised. I'm not saying that they didn't have sex. I understand why he's arguing it. I think he doesn't want Melania to leave him. This is a psychological thing. But it doesn't make any sense to me how everybody's like, oh, Donald Trump's behavior was unacceptable. If it takes two people to cheat, she's also in a position of being a cheater. Worse than Trump, she is violating her non-disclosure agreement, which is exactly what he paid her not to do. So why is she some paragon of virtue here? She is a porn star who got paid for sex and effectively Donald Trump paid her for sex, right? I don't understand why in any world she is in some form or fashion a hero. She wants to be paid for sex and she wants to be paid even more for sex even though she signed a non-disclosure agreement. I, I don't understand it at all. And again, if you hate Donald Trump, stop this. All right, I'm one of the few people who's actually been consistent. I have said that Bill Clinton should not be removed for office for having a consensual sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky. I said that when I was 18 or 19 years old. I actually worked to ensure that Bill Clinton was not impeached. But if you in any way believed that Bill Clinton should remain in office, then it's seriously impossible for you to argue that Donald Trump should have to be removed from office for this. Remember, Bill Clinton lied about it all the time. He went on national television and said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. He said that depends on what the meaning of the word is is. He was caught under oath lying about a sexual relationship because he thought he could get away with it. He kept his job. So for everybody out there who's like, oh, Donald Trump lied about it, he went to the back of Air Force One and said he didn't know about it. Okay, then his lawyer got raided. He realized probably it was all going to come out. And now he said to Rudy Giuliani, okay, go talk about it. It doesn't make sense. Again, Bill Clinton, 12 years ago in office, had an affair with an intern, caught, went on television and told the American public that there was no relationship at all. And then he later said uh, that, uh, that, that he did not have a relationship with her under oath and he was proven to be a liar and he was impeached for it, but the Senate did not vote to remove him. And that was with a Republican Congress, by the way. The majority of the Senate at the time was Republican. You have to get 67 votes. It's not happening. Okay, that's the truth. And so people who don't understand this, is it's, it's amazing to me. I don't care who the president slept with. And we don't even need to get into the historical record of who all the people that presidents have slept with in the past. I care about their ability to do the job in front of them right now. Okay, so that is the truth. That is the story. Any questions? If you don't like Donald Trump, beat him in 2020. Thank God the United States Constitution does not give lifetime tenure to presidents. You're almost halfway through. Go beat him in 2020. You have the opportunity. You can put forward a great candidate. We're almost halfway through Donald Trump's administration and it's going to take forever and you're not going to be able to impeach him, I don't think, and you're certainly not going to be able to remove him from office. And by the way, if you did remove him from office, you'd be going up against Mike Pence who may be a much more uh, conservative politician and frankly, may be much more difficult to beat. That's the truth. Uh, so, that is the story there. What questions do you guys have about this from a legal perspective? Are there any questions that anybody has? Because I think the media does a poor job talking about stories like this. And I just want to walk you through so that you have a better understanding uh, what exactly happened. Uh, any questions at all about this story legally? I don't, I've not seen any of the Michael Cohen stuff. I think, again, the, the primary motive of Rudy Giuliani was to take the pressure off of Michael Cohen. If Trump can make an argument, if he was paying Michael Cohen several hundred thousand dollars a year, and I think it was likely, if he was paying Michael Cohen several hundred thousand dollars a year to represent him, then Trump's argument can be pretty straightforward. Hey, I gave him $130,000. I paid him $300,000 last year. He had a job and he had an obligation to handle any such stories like these, and he did. I think there should be. It's a good question. 
there should be repercussions for breaking non-disclosure agreements. I don't understand all these people out there who sign non-disclosure agreements for which you are being paid to do. Think about this for a minute now. The NDA is not admitting liability. It specifically is payment to require you to never talk about the fact of this story or that you were paid. That's literally why you're getting the money. You're not getting the money. Think about this. People don't understand this either. When you sign an NDA, you are signing an NDA because you are being paid to never talk about this story again. And in exchange for money, your silence is being purchased. I don't understand. Typically, all these contracts have millions and millions of dollars in penalties if you ever violate the NDA because otherwise, nobody would ever sign an NDA. That's the entire purpose. And by NDA, I mean a non-disclosure agreement. So that's the truth. And I don't understand why one side can kind of do it. The campaign finance violations, again, I took campaign finance law in college. Campaign finance violations are insanely common. If you don't believe me, just Google every politician and, and campaign finance violations and look up how often it happens. There are much more serious campaign finance violations than this one. During the 1996 campaign, I think it was Bill Clinton's campaign and Bob Dole's campaign, but primarily Bill Clinton's, they took a ton of money from all of these, uh, all these Chinese foreign legals. Foreign investors poured millions of dollars into the campaigns in order to influence the outcome of the election. Everybody now is focused on Russia. Guys, if you read campaign finance history, there were actual foreign nationals giving millions of dollars to our campaigns. Everybody's like, oh my God, Russia bought Facebook ads. And historically in campaign finance violations, Russian Facebook ads are a fraction of the issues that have been at play. Just If you don't believe me, just trust me. Go out there and type in your favorite politician and campaign finance violations and I almost would guarantee you that just about every politician under the sun has in some way violated campaign finance law or Federal Election Commission law. It's insanely common. So just go do it and look it up and then understand larger context. This is not a real story. Okay, uh, WWE. I don't know if you guys saw this. Uh, go read my article on it. Obviously, I've spent a lot of time talking about this, uh, this Donald Trump story. But the WWE is utterly fascinating to me. I'm just going to give you some data here. I'm a WWE shareholder. They hit an all-time uh, 52-week high here. And I think this is worth discussing. Uh, this was wild. What do you think? It, how much do you think all these television contracts cost per viewer? I think this is incredibly interesting. How much uh, time is spent on all of these, okay? Uh, how much money is spent? NBA cable sports networks, every viewer is being paid $3.24. NBA on TNT costs nearly $3. Uh, NFL on cable, $2. Major League Baseball cable sports networks, $1.95. This is per viewer. And it's in my article. I'd encourage you, if you're fascinated by this data like I am, to go read OutKick.com. UFC broadcast, $1.35 per viewer. NHL, uh, $1.24. Major League Baseball broadcast, $1.20. Right now, the WWE gets paid $0.20 cents and for Raw and $0.19 cents for SmackDown. This is, this is wild. Uh, 17 times as much money is spent on the NBA average viewer as is spent on the WWE. Uh, one reason that I've been telling you guys to buy WWE stock is the WWE, this is an amazing stat you probably won't hear anywhere else either. WWE Raw beat for 2018, its average viewership, it beat the first round of the NBA playoffs. Think about that for a minute. The NBA viewer costs 17 times as much as the WWE viewer. When you actually go through the data, uh, the WWE Raw had more average viewers than the NBA playoff games did. The WWE, I'm telling you, I've been telling you to buy it for years, it is a steal. And by the way, for all the WWNBA, uh, the, uh, all the NBA uh, sunshine pumpers out there, your yearly product was up 2% over last year. 2%. This idea that the NBA is on fire and the NFL uh, in a good way and the NFL is on fire in a bad way is just flagrantly not, to, not true. I think lots of companies could buy the WWE. I think Disney could buy them. I think Turner could buy them if they ever get through this AT&T Time Warner uh, deal. I think Fox could buy them. I think NBC could decide to buy them. Right now, the company's valued at $3 billion. 
I think it's a hell of a bill. I, I, th I buy. I would buy them if I were Netflix. I think Amazon could buy them. I think it's uh, it's it's amazing story. If you're at all intrigued by my WWE talk, go uh, check it out at uh, at Outkick.com. Uh, did you see ESPN throw Jamel Hill and Michael Smith under the bus? I got to give credit to ESPN here. If you remember the first Woke Center, it was Woke Center PM, and it was on at 6 p.m. Eastern, and the ratings tanked and everything fell apart. And Michael Smith and Jamel Hill both got fired. Well, this is wild. ESPN, in a ratings, in a announcement, a PR release, they announced that Stephen A. Smith was going to be hosting SportsCenter soon, and they buried in that article a absolute decapitation of Jamel Smith and Mike, uh, Jamel Hill and Michael Smith. It says April's 6 p.m. Sports Center has uh, grown 9% over last year, and the growth for April followed a 4% year-over-year rise in viewership for March. Ever since they pulled Michael Smith and Jamel Hill off of 6 p.m. Woke Center, the ratings have skyrocketed. This is a amazing detail, though. I never remember seeing this before, where a company took a shot at somebody else who used to work at that same company. I've never seen anything like it before. It is mind-blowing to me. Credit to ESPN. They are trying to create as much space between their corporate structure and Jamel Hill and Michael Smith and the disaster of the 6 p.m. Sports Center as possible. But this proves my point that I've been arguing for a long time, which is Woke Center is bad business. The other thing is AM Woke Center is down 18% over last year's ratings. So Woke Center isn't just awful in terms of its obsession with mixing politics and sports. And I don't mind mixing politics and sports, but I think if you're going to do it, you have to be even-handed. You have to mix left-wing politics and sports and right-wing politics and sports. If I were ESPN, I would have a no political talk policy. I think I would. That's no doubt at all on my side. I think it makes no sense whatsoever. But if you were going to do it, it makes no sense whatsoever to take this path of trying to have politics mixed with sports at all. It makes zero sense. And so as a result, I think if you go through and do it, it is fascinating to see what exactly is going to happen. Go with either a balanced perspective where you have left and right wings or don't mix politics at all, the viewer doesn't want it, and they certainly don't want it in the morning, and they certainly don't want it when they're expecting sports news, and instead they get everybody who's conservative fired, like Kurt Schilling, and everybody who's liberal, like Jamel Hill, gets rewarded. A couple of other points I want to hit here. Uh, Kirby Smart, $7 million man. Kirby Smart, congratulations. He was making $8,000 when he started his career uh, there are now just uh, seven coaches, according to Stuart Mandel, who have made a uh, make $7 million a year. Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney, Urban Meyer, Jim Harbaugh, Jimbo Fisher, Kirby Smart, and Gus Malzahn. What's interesting about those seven? What's interesting about those seven is Jim Harbaugh is by far the most overpaid. Nick Saban, obviously national titles. Dabo Sweeney, national titles. Urban Meyer, national titles. Um, Jimbo Fisher, national title. Kirby Smart, uh, close to a national title. I think it's fair to say he has a really good chance of getting a national title. Gus Malzahn, close to a national title, certainly an SEC championship. Everybody else on this list has won a championship, at least a conference championship, at their, at their respective school. Jim Harbaugh has not. He is the most overpaid coach and overrated coach in all of college football right now. Finally, Jason Witten has retired to Monday Night Football. If you want to make a living in media... You need to play for the Dallas Cowboys. This now means that Troy Aikman, Daryl Moose Johnson, uh, Tony Romo, Jason Witten, and Michael Irvin, and Deion Sanders, all six of them notified, recognized as former Dallas Cowboys, are now making millions of dollars as big-time sports prognosticators in the NFL universe. I don't think it's a coincidence that they all pay, played for the Dallas Cowboys. Also, I want to reiterate what I told you guys a while back. Jason Witten was ready to leave the NFL, and he was very interested in being the next head football coach at the University of Tennessee. He would have left the last season if he had officially gotten that offer. He didn't get the offer, and instead he left at the end of this season to go join Monday Night Football. 
Maybe Witten wants to coach one day. I think he wants to try out Monday Night Football and see how much he likes it. He's going to make four mil- over $4 million doing Monday Night Football with Joe Tessitore. We'll see how it goes. I like Jason Witten. Smart guy. I think we'll do well in the booth. We'll see exactly how all of that goes. Uh, all right. I appreciate all of you coming and hanging out with me and spending your Thursday afternoon. We'll be live tomorrow morning, 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Make sure that you don't miss it. And if there's a lot of news, I'll also do a Friday early afternoon show. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for spending your Thursday with me. Share this if you enjoyed the breakdown legally. Just like I told you guys when I came out, sometimes I think the media does a bad job analyzing complex stories because there aren't enough intelligent people explaining things. I try to talk to everybody like you're a jury. I'm not trying to get into the legal weeds, but I try to talk to you in a reasonably intelligent fashion about what is oftentimes very complicated stories and explain exactly what's going on long before most people in the media get around to doing it. Love you guys. My name is Clay Travis. This has been Outkick the Show. Go download the podcast. Go hang out with us. Go read Outkick if you want more stories on either Woke Center throwing Michelle and uh, Michael and Jamel under the bus or if you want to read about the WWE. DBAP, boys and girls, don't be a pussy. My name is Clay Travis. This has been Outkick the Show.